They woke up, all four at once, in the morning light. Tom was moving about the room, whistling like a starling. When he heard them stir, he clapped his hands and cried, Hey, come, merry doll, merry doll, my hearties. He drew back the yellow curtains, and the hobbit saw that these had covered the windows at either end of the room, one looking east and the other looking west. They leapt up refreshed. Frodo ran to the eastern window and found himself looking into a kitchen garden, grey with dew. He had half expected to see turf right up to the walls, turf all pocked with hoof prints. Actually, his view was screened by a tall line of beans on poles, but above and far beyond them the grey top of the hill loomed up against the sunrise. It was a pale morning. In the east, behind long clouds like lines of soiled wool stained red at the edges, lay glimmering deeps of yellow. The sky spoke of rain to come, but the light was broadening quickly, and the red flowers on the beans began to glow against the wet green leaves. Pippin looked out of the western window, down into a pool of mist. The forest was hidden under a fog. It was like looking down onto a sloping cloud roof from above. There was a fold or channel where the mist was broken into many plumes and billows, the valley of the Withy Windle. The stream ran down the hill on the left and vanished into the white shadows. Near at hand was a flower garden, and a clipped hedge silver netted, and beyond that grey shaven grass pale with dewdrops. There was no willow tree to be seen. Good morning, merry friends, cried Tom, opening the eastern window wide. A cool air flowed in. It had a rainy smell. Sun won't show her face much today, I'm thinking. I have been walking wide, leaping on the hilltops since the grey dawn began, nosing wind and weather, wet grass underfoot, wet sky above me. I waken Goldberry singing under window, but naught wakes hobbit folk in the early morning. In the night little folk wake up in the darkness, and sleep after light has come. ring a ding a dillo Wake now, my merry friends, forget the nightly noises. Ring a ding, dillo dell, dairy dell, my hearties. If you come soon, you'll find breakfast on the table. If you come late, you'll get grass and rain water. Needless to say, not that Tom's threat sounded very serious, the hobbits came soon and left the table late and only when it was beginning to look rather empty. Neither Tom nor Goldberry were there. Tom could be heard about the house, clattering in the kitchen, and up and down the stairs, and singing here and there outside. The room looked westward over the mist-clouded valley, and the window was open. Water dripped down from the thatched eaves above. Before they had finished breakfast, the clouds had joined into an unbroken roof, and a straight grey rain came softly and steadily down. Behind its deep curtain, the forest was completely veiled. As they looked out of the window, there came falling gently as if it was flowing down the rain out of the sky, the clear voice of Goldberry singing up above them. They could hear few words, but it seemed plain to them that the song was a rain song, as sweet as showers on dry hills, that told the tale of a river from the spring in the highlands to the sea far below. The hobbits listened with delight, and Frodo was glad in his heart, and blessed the kindly weather, because it delayed them from departing. The thought of going had been heavy upon him from the moment he awoke, but he guessed now that they would not go further that day. The upper wind settled in the west, and deeper and wetter clouds rolled up to spill their laden rain on the bare heads of the downs. Nothing could be seen all round the house but falling water. Frodo stood near the open door and watched the white chalky path turn into a little river of milk and go bubbling away down into the valley. Tom Bombadil came trotting round the corner of the house waving his arms as if he was warding off the rain, and indeed, when he sprang over the threshold, he seemed quite dry, except for his boots. These he took off and put in the chimney corner. Then he sat in the largest chair and called gather the hobbits to gather round him. This is Goldberry's washing day, he said, and her autumn cleaning. Too wet for hobbit folk. Let them rest while they are able. It's a good day for long tales, for questions and for answers, so Tom will start the talking. He then told them many remarkable stories, sometimes half as if speaking to himself, sometimes looking at them suddenly with a bright blue eye under his deep brows. Well, then he went over 
Often his voice would turn to song, and he would get out of his chair and dance about. He told them tales of bees and flowers, the ways of trees, and the strange creatures of the forest, about the evil things and good things, things friendly and things unfriendly, cruel things and kind things, and secrets hidden under brambles. As they listened, they began to understand the lives of the forest apart from themselves, indeed to feel themselves as the strangers where all other things were at home. Moving constantly in and out of this talk was old man Willow, and Frodo learned now enough to content him, indeed more than enough, for it was not comfortable law. Tom's words laid bare the hearts of trees and their thoughts, which were often dark and strange, and filled with a hatred of things that go free upon the earth, gnawing, biting, breaking, hacking, burning, destroyers and usurpers. It was not called the old forest without a reason, for it was indeed ancient a survivor of vast forgotten woods, and in it there lived yet, aging no quicker than the hills, the fathers of the fathers of trees, remembering times when they were lords. The countless years had filled them with pride and rooted wisdom and with malice. But none were more dangerous than the great willow. His heart was rotten, but his strength was green, and he was cunning and a master of winds and his song and thought ran through the woods on both sides of the river. His grey, thirsty spirit drew power out of the earth and spread like fine root threads in the ground and invisible twig fingers in the air, till it had under its dominion nearly all the trees of the forest, from the hedge to the downs. Suddenly Tom's talk left the woods and went leaping up the young stream, over bubbling waterfalls, over pebbles and worn rocks, and among small flowers and close grass and wet crannies, wandering at last up on to the downs. They heard of the great barrows, and the green mounds, and the stone rings upon the hills, and in the hollows among the hills. Sheep were bleating in flocks, green walls and white walls rose. There were fortresses on the heights, Kings of little kingdoms fought together, and the young sun shone like fire on the red metal of their new and greedy swords. There was victory and defeat. The towers fell, fortresses were burned, and flames went up into the sky. Gold was piled on the byres of dead kings and queens, and mounds covered them. And the stone doors were shut, and the grass grew over all. Sheep walked for a while, biting the grass, but soon the hills were empty again. A shadow came out of dark places far away, and the bones were stirred in the mounds. Barrow whites walked in the hollow places with a clink of rings on cold fingers and gold chains in the wind. Stone rings grinned out of the ground like broken teeth in the moonlight. The hobbits shuddered. Even in the Shire, the rumors of the barrow whites of the barrow downs beyond the forest had been heard. But it was not a tale that any hobbit liked to listen to, even by a comfortable fireside far away. These four now suddenly remembered what the joy of this house had driven from their minds. The house of Tom Bombardin nestled under the very shoulder of those dreaded hills. They lost the thread of his tale and shifted uneasily, looking aside at one another. When they caught his words again, they found that he had now wandered into strange regions beyond their memory and beyond their waking thought, into times when the world was wider and the seas flowed straight to the western shore. And still on and back, Tom went singing out into the ancient starlight, when only the elf sires were awake. Then suddenly he stopped, and they saw that he nodded as if he were falling asleep. The hobbits sat still before him, enchanted, and it seemed as if under the spell of his words the wind had gone and the clouds had dried up, and the day had been withdrawn. And darkness had come from east and west, and all the sky was filled with the light of white stars. Whether the morning and evening of one day or of many days had passed, Frodo could not tell. He did not feel either hungry or tired, only filled with wonder. The stars shone through the window, and the silence of the heavens seemed to be round him. He spoke at last, out of his wonder and sudden fear of that silence. Who are you, master? He asked. <laughs> eh? What? Said Tom, sitting up and his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. 
Tell me, who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? But you are young, and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrow whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already, before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the stars when it was fearless, before the dark lord came from outside. A shadow seemed to pass by the window and the hobbits glanced hastily through the panes. When they turned again, Goldberry stood in the door behind, framed in light. She held a candle, shielding its flame from the draft with her hand, and the light flowed through it, like sunlight through a white shell. The rain has ended, she said, and new waters are running downhill under the stars. Let us now laugh and be glad. And let us have food and drink, cried Tom. Long tales are thirsty, and long listening is hungry work, morning, noon, and evening. With that, he jumped out of his chair and, with a bound, took a candle from the chimney shelf and lit it in the flame that Goldberry held. Then he danced about the table. Suddenly, he hopped through the door and disappeared. Quickly, he returned, bearing a large and laden tray. Then Tom and Goldberry set the table, and the hobbits sat half in wonder and half in laughter. So fair was the grace of Goldberry, and so merry and odd the caperings of Tom. Yet in some fashion they seemed to weave a single dance, neither hindering the other, in and out of the room, and round about the table. And with great speed, food and vessels and lights were set in order. The boards blazed with candles, white and yellow. Tom bowed to his guests. Supper is ready, said Goldberry, and now the hobbits saw that she was clothed all in silver with a white girdle and her shoes were like fish's mail. But Tom was all in clean blue, blue as rain washed forget-me-nots, and he had green stockings.